the name of the group um, really doesn't mean anything at all. Um, Ocean Colour Scene doesn't mean anything. It's no, it doesn't refer to anything in England. It, it's just simply three words that we sort of like the sound of. And we just put them together. Um, then we sort of told ourselves for about a fortnight that we couldn't possibly call ourselves Ocean Colour Scene. And we did. But it only means us, really. <coughs> well, we formed in October 1989. Um, and we got a recording contract straight away, I guess, with an independent called Fit Records. Um, and then we were sort of signed over to Fontana, <coughs> where we made our first album called Ocean Colour Scene, which didn't do that well, really. And then we sort of we left that record label and then spent the next couple of years just writing and honing a sound, I guess. And then we put out an album called Moses Shoals in 1996, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then since 1996, it's been kind of quite, um, quite regular. We've been regular <laughs> since 1996. Since 1996. Yeah, since then we've just been playing and travelling, recording, putting out records. Um, which led up to this year, where we put out our seventh studio album, I think, called um, I'd Like to Work Out with the Flying Squad. And I think it's, personally, I think it's one of the best things that we've done. I think the... So the, 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 I don't know whether the rec a record company doesn't really have a great deal of influence on our music at all. Um, they rarely or never really make suggestions concerning our music. Um, we just sort of do what we what we do, and we're grateful if there's someone there who can put it out as a record. You know, but uh, we're one of those bands where they do, they, we go into the studio and they kind of let us get on with it. Really. In England, music critics are. Um, they're mainly criminals. Mm, they're mainly criminals in England, unfortunately. Um, but uh, in Europe, we find music critics are, um, are really nice. They are. They they're sort of seem more interested and um, show you some more respect than in England. England, um, they're like a pack of wolves. I think that, I mean, when, when Mosey Shoals came out, a lot of people in the press liked it and a lot of people hated it and a lot of people hated us. But it sold an enormous amount of records, Mosey Shoals, and we got television and we got the radio. And I think that television and radio gives, the, you know, the, the public a chance to make up their own mind. And that was always something which uh, kept us in good stead, I think. Um, people like singing along and they like our songs and that's why I think that we're very popular in Ireland and Scotland and um, that kind of Celtic Celtic countries I think are closer to just singing, just singing around a piano or singing in a pub and we are, we are the, sort of the best pub band in England I think. But the Spanish crowds even very early on, we're similar to um, the, the, the Scots and the Irish, whether it's a, a Catholic thing or a Celtic thing, I don't know, but uh, you know, we've always been treated very well in Spain, and the crowds have always been warm to it. It was a song of Mosey Shores, and um, Cool One for the Road, and some, a fan of ours, their brother was killed actually in, in a car crash in Spain. And um, they wrote to us saying that we were his favourite group. And would it be all right if they put the words from the chorus of the song on his gravestone? And that was... That brought it to home how important it can be in music to people's lives. And it was just... That was a real shock. But it's when, when something like that happens, you know, and if you've just got... the 
if someone in a, in a magazine or a newspaper has just criticised you or they hate you and, and something like that happens and it makes you realise just actually what it's all about and it's not about, you know, dressing up and putting on makeup for magazines, it's about the fans. Naturally, I guess a folk singer, I pick up an acoustic guitar and I sing, and that's all I can do really. I'm rubbish at playing the electric guitar. I'm the worst drummer in the world, and I can't play the piano. So my natural thing is to pick up an acoustic guitar and sing, so there's an obvious link there in folk music. Isn't there? And also I grew up listening to Neil Young and Bob Dylan and American folk music as well. But having said that, my approach to a group was always, for me, was the blueprint for me was uh, the Beatles. Ever since I was a child, I loved the Beatles, and I loved the fact that they were in a, in a gang and they all looked the same, and uh, and they were always happy and joking. And, uh, so the Beatles and <laughs> sad music as well. I don't think anyone can be 100 percent original anyway. I mean, in, in a sense, you want to. You want to emulate your heroes, you know, the people who, um, who do you think is original? Well, there's been certain, you know, I'd say what Bob Dylan was doing is original, but you can, t you can t track him back, you can track anyone back to what's influenced them before. So I don't, I, I don't think it's possible to be 100% original. I think you just, uh, ultimately, all you could do is, is do, is play and sing and write how you, how you play. And after 15, 16 years of being in a group together, you do develop that kind of, the like fact that we sound like us because of the people who are in the group, obviously. So we don't really... We might nick a few ideas and say, take a record, an idea of a record that we like, but um, I think on the whole we kind of come up with our own sound, far more so than when we formed, you know. In, in the group proper is um, myself and Steve and Oscar, our drummer, and we've been there from the beginning. Our bass player left us um, about 18 months ago, I think. Um, after a fight over a bottle of brandy. Um, <laughs> and so we've got two, two guys who are over here with us um, who um, have been playing on the tour with us. Uh, one's Dan Seeley, who is, uh, plays bass with us, but he also plays guitar and piano and sings. And, and we've got Andy Bennett, who plays guitar with us. And both have had their own groups, and we've known Andy since he was a child. He used to come to our rehearsals when he was 10. And uh, 16 years later, he's in the group. basically play set will be involved sort of all, all of the mixtures off the seven albums that we've recorded in studios. We don't sort of have guests. We play we play a lot. We play a lot off the new album. Well that was one thing that we wanted to do. Was that the only real plan with the new album was to come up with an album where we could play a set at least six songs or seven songs from it in the live set. Because for people who've been coming along and seeing us for years we don't feel that we should be going out there and just repeating the old set. Also, we want to play new songs as well. Uh, so it's a lot, a lot of that, uh, quite a lot of Mosey Shoals and sort of the singles. Really. And we normally finish with um, Day Tripper by the Beatles. I like going to the States. We've been quite a few times to America. Um, we haven't been for... Uh, actually, the last time we was meant to go to America was September the 12th. 
the day after the Twin Towers. We were meant to start touring in the States there. Well, obviously, because of what happened in New York, it seemed totally inappropriate to go and tour in the States. Um, but we've, we've toured all over the States. We toured for eight weeks in the States. We did 12,000 miles in a bus um, with a band called The House of Love. And that was a fantastic experience. Fantastic. All the different cities are so different, the different coasts. When I took it to Canada, um, I loved it. Japan's brilliant. It's like going to another planet, Japan. And you can't read anything. Um, but uh, again, the Japanese audiences have been um, really, really good. You know. But they've, they've changed, they've sort of westernized in, in the time that we've been together. They all dye their hair brown. And instead of clapping for three seconds like they used to do, they clap now as you would in, in London. I think they've all been, they've all spent, they've all been on trips to New York and London, like the Japanese youth, and run up huge bills on their parents' credit cards and sort of have become much more aware of, um, of Western music and Western pop culture. It's become less important because there's, basically there's a much, much bigger middle class than there ever used to be. Um, and the old working class industries, mining, fishing, steel making, car making, have largely disappeared um, and gone abroad. So there's a much more um, sort of IT, you know, turned on middle class population. And also I think certainly after the war in the 50s, a lot of people of working class, sort of, from working class families, sort of felt that it wasn't really their right to be anything other than working class. And so now, almost everyone seems to go to university. Now. When I was a kid, about 5% of people went to university. So, but I'm sure that's very similar. You know, for, for most countries in Europe, it, the, the class thing has become much, much less of, a, uh, of an issue. Having said that, you can go to certain places, and it is an issue, and you have what is almost an underclass. Madrid-Barcelona thing, it was a real surprise. I didn't realize quite how like that it is.